Welcome to the Woodpreneur Podcast, the number one podcast for the business and marketing side of the lumber, woodworking, hardwood, flooring, and sawmill industry. I'm your host, Steve from Acres of Timber. Each week, we feature various wood business owners and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We share their stories, paths, insights so that you can network, learn, and grow your own wood business. Thank you so much for listening. Now enjoy the episode. The Woodpreneur Podcast is proudly sponsored by Acres CRM. Acres CRM is the wood industry's only customer relationship management software dedicated to helping you automate your sales and marketing so that you can focus on serving your customers and growing your business. You can visit acresoftimber.com to learn more and to schedule a demo. Once again, that's acresoftimber.com. Hey, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Woodprinter Podcast. This is your host, Steve. Today's guest is Mike Hoy from Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs. How you doing, Mike? Good. How you doing, Steve? Good. Thank you. Hey, tell everybody, what is Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs? You know, Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs, how it became was it started back when I was a little kid, just being interested in working with my hands, being interested in building things. At 12 years of age, my mom's ex-husband, you know, had a welder and he taught me how to weld. And then I just really took off from there. I got into construction. I worked with one home builder and he was awesome, you know, because I told him my goal was I wanted to do built-ins. I wanted to do cabinetry. I wanted to build furniture. And he told me right away, he's like, you know, I mean, those are great things, but your demographic clientele is so small because you have to reach, you know, certain people that want custom built stuff. And not everybody wants that, you know, not everybody's willing to take that on. So he's like, your best thing is to get into construction, you know, build yourself some capital and then, you know, go into that stuff. And as you're doing those projects in construction, you know, encourage the clients or, you know, ask them, hey, you want to build in here or you want cabinetry here and see if you can get those projects and then build your clientele. And so that's what I did. I actually became a licensee, did basements, additions and stuff like that. Built, you know, a nice business got some capital and now as a getting older in my life now I'm focusing in on you know doing more of the built-ins and just doing all the you know the furniture and stuff like that my goal is you know right now I'm pushing 50 once I get into my 50s and 60s I want to just you know get to the point where I can just be building furniture well I've had a progression you know construction company I've done that next progression is just doing built-ins and you know cabinetry My final progression will be just doing, you know, my cabinets. I do a lot of guitar cabinets and stuff like that. So that's kind of where my goal is. We're wanting to go to NAM next year and see if we can get some, you know, stuff set up through the guitar community and start hopefully building those. That's awesome, man. So you started off doing construction and then you leveraged that to start doing more built-ins. And then eventually the goal is to do more furniture. Correct. Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting path because to me, what I've been really interested in as it relates to like the wood space is the value of a client project, right? If you look at the value, like construction is probably the highest, built-ins are probably the second highest, and then furniture is the lowest, right? In which I uh, could probably see that that strategy work out for you. It has been, I mean, because I had a huge demographic. I mean, when you do basements and stuff like that, there's so many people that want them. So yeah. you're going to get projects, you're going to get work. And then, you know, as you build stuff for those clients, now you get yourself a picture portfolio. You have a client now that, you know, will refer to you for those type of things too. So, I mean, it was a great way to get it started. So now that I'm focusing just in on those things now, you know, I've got all these clients that are, they still giving my name out. For stuff like that. Once I transitioned from construction, I reached out to all of those clients too. And I let them know, you remember I had taught you about the fact that this is where I wanted to go in my career. You know, I'm doing that now. And they're like, oh, fantastic. Well, I've got this that I want you to do, or I've got this, or, you know, I've got these friends. And so it really, helped. the guy was smart. The builder was smart who told me that because it has benefited me. Guys that I've talked to that just trying to go right into furniture and built-ins, they struggled for a long time just because you just don't have that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So you're in Peyton, Colorado, very yeah. small town, right? You know, some high quality internet where you, <laughs> yeah. 
Wonderful internet. A <laughs> wonderful, fast, high-speed internet. Yeah. Totally reliable. Just joking. To everybody that doesn't get that reference, we had some internet problems before we hopped on the call. But where did you get most of your projects from? Were you sourcing them from Colorado Springs? You know, I've got a lot of friends that I've worked with over the years. But that's one of the awesome things about the construction community and also the woodworking community. I've got, you know, buddies that have been doing woodworking forever and construction. And so when I was in my construction business, you know, I would talk to all the other contractors because sometimes they would get projects that they just didn't want or they didn't have time for. And they're like, here, why don't you take this off? You know, and I give them a little bit. Hey, thank you, Burl B. And that's kind of how I did that. But I also went to, you know, all the designers, you know, I went to all the home builders. I went to real estate agents. I went to all these places, you know, where there was a new home development going on. Yeah go to the sales office and I would, you know, talk to the salespeople, give them cards and stuff like that. Because when the people buy homes, they need stuff done in them. You know, there's yeah. always something that they want to change or something like that. So I made all those contacts. And so that's really where I got a lot of my work is, you know, I didn't have to pay for many leads because I would just go to those people and they would just hand out my cards. So were you always called Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs or what was the company called before the construction company? My construction company was Hoy Enterprises. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it still in existence? No, I mean, I have got, I'm not doing anything with it right now. I'm not running any projects through it. I mean, it's still there. I still have my GC license and stuff like that, but it's not, you know, that was kind of my past, you know, I'm moving on now. And so that's why I've got Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs and that's my future. Okay. Okay. So talk about the genesis of Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs. So, I mean, Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs, what I did was I actually hooked up a um, slab supplier up in Denver, really great guy. And so what we were talking about is, you know, down in Colorado Springs, most people down in Colorado Springs have to go to Denver to get their wood slabs. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to have somebody down in Colorado Springs that has a good selection of wood slabs so that people didn't have to travel so far. And in my area, there's a lot of woodworkers in the area of Payton. And so that's what I've been doing is I've been, you know, selling to a lot of the woodworkers down here and, you know, and I worked out a deal with him. And so he's got the eye dry kiln system. He's set up with the whole, you know, sawmill and everything. So he does all that work. And then I just bring it down here and then I can sell it directly from my shop. And if people want anything, you know, I can always purchase it right from him and, you know, sell it directly to them. So you, you have a retail business? Yeah, that's one aspect of it. You know, when I set up Rocky Mountain Wood Slabs, I wanted to be able to, you know, the way to make money is to have constant flow of cash coming in from different avenues. So if I can sell the slabs, that's great. If I can buy them and, you know, bulk from him, and if I can just build tables and build stuff with them, then I can make money off of it that way too. So I've had a lot of clients that, you know, want tables and stuff like that done, who've done a lot of bar tops and, you know, dining room tables and stuff like that. So I've got different, you know, avenues through the wood slabs to make money, but I've also been doing a ton of kitchen. So we've been doing a lot of kitchen cabinets. Custom cabinets from kitchens? Yeah, we've been doing a lot of that. You know, it seems like a lot of people are starting to get more interested in that. You know, there's just so many benefits to having a custom cabinet build as opposed to buying it from these other, you know, just cabinet companies. That's really fascinating. Who are you finding are the people that want? Could you describe the type of client that wants custom cabinets? You know, obviously it is more of a lot of times the higher end clientele. You know, I do a lot of work in Denver. We did a project in Boulder and it's usually people who want something that is, you know, quality. One of the big struggles that happened with COVID is everything got delayed. You know, you used to be able to go to these cabinet stores and maybe get cabinets in six to eight weeks. But then suddenly got pushed out to like 19 to 24 weeks, you know, just because everything got backlogged. And so people started going, wait a minute, there's got to be a better way to get cabinets. And so I think that opened it up somewhat for the custom guy, just because, you know, you can get it faster. One of the things that I share with people too is, you know, I did a basement project. I was finishing one up at the time of COVID and, you know, the client decided to go with one of the cabinet stores, cabinets. We put it in. And when it arrived, it had two doors that were busted and a drawer front that were busted. So they had to send it back for warranty. It took four months to get those. Back. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, and I told them if they had gone through me as a custom builder, I mean, you're talking about a week. A week. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. It's a big difference. So people are coming to you. They want higher end clientele. They want more custom stuff. They want to actually know probably where their wood is coming from. Right. right. And, and you're designing, right? Like, are you designing on like SketchUp or one of these other softwares? Yeah, I've been working with that pro kitchen. I've been yeah, trying yeah. to like, try and figure out that. I'll be honest with you. I work great with my hands. I'm can build you anything, but yeah, yeah, yeah. he's not my friend. <laughs> so I've been working on that myself, but yeah, it's a really nice program. So you've been working on Pro Kitchen and you're building everything from scratch. Do you have a team with you? No, no. You know, what I do, I learned this through the trades. I mean, it's so hard to find quality people nowadays. Yeah. Really, it's such a challenge. And what I was doing is I found that I was fixing more of what they were doing then if I had just done it myself in the first place, it would have been so much better. Did you have a team with Hoy Enterprises? I sure did. Yeah, yeah. We had How, 10, uh, employees. 10 employees. Yeah. Wow. So oh. it seems like Rocky Mountain Woodstocks is truly your passion right now, right? Like you did one business, one style. Now this is an opportunity to do it another way. Correct. This has been my dream since I was young. But, like, you know, this has always been my dream to just do this type of work and just do it myself. You know, if I need help moving stuff and, you know, I've got a 20 year old daughter, you can ask her, I drag her out all the time. Come on, help me move this slab or help me do that. Oh, I don't want to do that. But yeah. she comes, you know, she helps. I try and keep it just to myself. My overhead's low. And honestly, since I got rid of the guys, my stress level. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. And so how many kitchens are you doing a year? You think? You know, I can get kitchens done in about between painting and everything else, just depending the size, two to three months. So, you know, but there's a lot of profit to be made in them, you know, and people appreciate, like you said, the fact that, you know, one of the things that I always use for clients is it's like, if you have a computer problem, computers crashing and you have, you know, who would you rather help you with that? The guy who designed the computer and made it or the guy who's just, a, you know, the geek squad? Yeah, the opportunity to have the guy who designed it, you'd be like, do it, man. Yeah, that's the thing with you know custom cabinets is it's like instead of going through fifteen different hands that touched your cabinets, half the guys they're not you know really woodworkers. They're just you know they got a job. Yeah, and why wouldn't you rather have the actual guy you know and built them, install them as well, and then if you have any questions or have any changes or anything else like that, we can do it. And that's fascinating. How are you getting your jobs right now? Just word of mouth. You yeah. Know, I've been doing it for a long time. So I just. You have a lot of relationships. Yeah. I have a lot of relationships. One of the big relationships that I have is with designers. Mm. I've got really good designers in Denver and in Colorado Springs that, you know, I've had a few of them that just told me if I get a kitchen, it's yours. Mm. You know, if I get a built in, it's yours. Oh, my quality. They know the type of work I do. And so they just, you know, they're like, I don't even ask anybody else, which makes it so much better because when you're going directly through the client, you know, still people are like, I need 15 bids and, you know, and they don't make a decision. And it, whereas with you go to a designer, they do all the bid work, they do all that stuff. And then you say, here you go, you get the job. Yeah. 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 Trend wise, are people liking, are they doing like live edge countertops? Like, is it countertops too, or is it just more faces? No, it's, you know, we do the whole nine yards. We've been doing a lot of butcher block countertops. Okay. We do maple, walnut, white oak. Right now, the big one that we've been doing most is walnut. People just love that, you know, but we've done some maple. White oak is obviously everywhere, you know, right now. We just did a staircase up in Boulder where we did white oak treads. Do people like, do they like the sapwood or do they want like more of the hardwood? They like more of the hardwood, you know, yeah. most people, it just depends. But when it comes to like a butcher block, you try and get rid of the sapwood. Yeah. Paper. There's that hardwood color, you know. Fascinating. So, yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. What does the future hold for you? You know, the future holds for me is I'm going to be building these cabinets. I'm going to be building live edge. But like I said, I mean, really my slow down years. I really want to just focus in on like building guitar cases and stuff like that. Just building, you know, tables and stuff like that. It's my guitar case. I have never played the guitar. <laughs> I tried once, failed miserably. 
but a buddy of mine who works with me on him, he's an amazing guitarist and banjo player, but guitar has been something that I've loved my whole life. And so, you know, worked with a lot of clients that love the cases. They've got guitar collections. And so, you know, that's kind of my goal is just to be able to have, you know, almost like a retail show where I could just, you know, it's build to order. We custom build each one of them as desired. But that's growing. That's growing. And so, I mean, as soon as that can grow, you know, I'd love to just be able to just work in my shop and not have to work on job sites anymore. Do you think the guitar cases will be like a thing that you ship nationally? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We would ship, ship them all over. Yeah. yeah I am. That's, that's the cool. goal. That's, that's the goal. We've been following some of the guitar case companies out there and they put out some really nice products, but you know, they're not very diverse in the designs. And so we're trying to step outside the box and do some other creative stuff. I'm actually going to be posting one that we just finished up after our interview here, but you know, it's a pretty cool one that we did. That's cool. Very cool. Hey, so this is a part of the interview where I give you any marketing or business advice. Is there anything that, that I could help you with? I think, you know, with, with like the guitar cases, with Live Edge Tables, I mean, how I can market that better, how I can get something set up that, you know, I can be able to sell those directly to people without, you know, how I can get my website and stuff like that set up that I can actually market those better. So what do you think is the biggest opportunity area? What do you think is the biggest thing that you'd like to sell more of? You know, like I said, I'd really like to get into the guitar case. I think there's a big market yeah. for it. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that we've been selling a lot of them. And, you know, it's just being able to get into that market. How many of them have you done? Right now, we've sold about 12. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to give you very specific advice. And this advice can go to anybody that has a specialty product, right? I would create a separate brand for it. and like as you are continuing to grow your business, like as you're building, create a ton of content around that. I would connect on social with every guitarist that is out there. I would do a start to finish video, time-lapse video. I would get testimonials from your clients on how beautiful your work is. I would have you talking about the process as much. This would be like a pure content play, right? Mm -hmm. So like you're connecting with people, you are doing interviews with guitarists, you are, you know, potentially a guitarist podcast or like you're doing testimonials, you're showing videos, you're showing finished products and you could literally have 12 start to finish testimonials, videos, and all that sort of stuff. And just like pump $500 a month into this separate brand and grow it, right? Like grow likes and followers. And so that would be one thing on the paid ad and the content. And on the other end, well, the other thing that I would do is I would drop into guitarist groups, Facebook groups, and, you know, guitar collectors, hashtags. And I would just like connect with those people and have them follow you and you comment on how their beautiful collection and what it looks like. And then on the third end, so like one is pump up the content. Two is do a paid strategy to get people to you. Three is to actually connect with the audience, like interview them, guitar collectors, like interview them, like have them on. And then the fourth thing is that I would have an offer, have like a base offer, which like, what's your average price of a guitar? Right now, you know, our cases start around five grand. So I would have one at a 299 version, a 399 version, a 499 version. And then everything after that is completely custom. Makes sense. Right. And so like, but if you have a 399 version and this is stuff that you can bang out in your sleep. Right. And then maybe introduce a payment plan, right? Like three payments or whatever, introduce financing options. Like that literally could be a three to four hundred thousand dollar, half a million dollar a year business on its own. Yeah. See, that's what my goal is. I'd love that. Yeah. Was that helpful? Yeah, that's brilliant. I appreciate it. Yeah. 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 No. Literally anybody that's like I, I was talking to somebody about they do those, you know, entryway locker room type you know, thing. 
And the guy was like, you know what? I can bang out eight of those a month, right? And he's got the systems in place in order to do it. I was like, why are you doing that? Why are you trying to focus on everything else? And he was like, he's like, I know, I know, I know. And so we calculated that if he did that, he can bring in 300K a year, just that. And if he took a little bit less money, he hired somebody, he could probably get up to five to 600K just in that. You know what I mean? So I said this to another interview today is like, literally you, Mike Hoy, have the skills to employ people. I know it was a headache before, but now in this second iteration of your business, you now have the opportunity and the skills to actually hire who you want, not who came to you. And so like, for me, I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, all ideas are good. It all depends on your focus. But like, I would go hard on like looking at a way to scale it because the next thing you know, like you can just get into the design phase and outsource all of the building if that's what you want. And if your hands touch something, it's all on the custom stuff, Yeah, which is the 10K, 15, 20K style. The next thing you know, you got Garth Brooks as your client. You know what I mean? You're flying down to Nashville and Dallas or whatever. Or you're flying out to like Jackson Hole, Wyoming to do bills. And it's like a $30,000 build because it's so custom that your hands touch it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that would be awesome because, yeah, I mean, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But zeroing and focusing, that would be the key. Cool. Was that helpful? That was helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. 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 So any last bit of parting advice for the Woodpreneur community? You know, just keep on working. There's a lot of work to be done out there. And, you know, the biggest thing is, is we just got to keep doing it because it's tough. I mean, looking at the next generations coming up, it's getting fewer and far between. So, I mean, we just got to keep doing it, keep training these young guys so that they can take over for us when we're done. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for your time. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, and uh, you have a super interesting path. I'm excited to share it with the Woodpreneur community. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate your time. All right. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Woodpreneur Podcast, the number one podcast for the business and marketing side of the lumber, woodworking, hardwood, flooring, and sawmill industry. If you like what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and review. You can also tap into our community by visiting woodpreneurlife.com. Once again, that's woodpreneurlife.com. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next episode.